Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's session, How Marketers Should Think About Virtual Events. My name is Sarah Coleman. I'm a sales development representative at Arm Treasure Data. So I wanted to introduce today's presenter, Dennis Shao. Dennis is a fa the founder and principal consultant at Attention Retention LLC, a marketing consultant agency. Uh, Dennis works with brands and um, on content marketing, product marketing, and social media marketing. From 2008 to 2013, Dennis was a virtual event uh, strategist, helping companies like HP, Microsoft, Oracle, and Cisco plan and execute virtual events. Dennis is also the author of the book, Generate Sales Leads with Virtual Events, uh, which is available for purchase uh, at Amazon. Uh, also, for some quick housekeeping, an on-demand recording will be available immediately after this webinar. So feel free to view and download the attachments that's below the screen. Uh, also, we would love to hear from you. So if you have any questions during or after today's session, please submit them below and uh, we'll do our best to answer them. So without further ado, Dennis, go ahead and take this away. All right, thank you so much, Sarah. So as Sarah mentioned, hopefully uh, those of you in the audience who are marketers will find today's talk valuable because I am a marketer like you. And you, you'll probably have maybe you're already planned a virtual event or you're thinking about it because uh, we're all talking about virtual events these days. And I used to work on virtual events. So I'll tell you a little bit about my experience. I'm going to take you back in time for, for a little bit. Then we'll come back to the present because I think what you're all here for is not so much the past but the present. And I'm going to talk to you about my views on how you should be thinking about virtual events. The journey of time starts back in 2005, actually. That was before I started working with virtual events. This is, I, I believe, still one of the, or maybe the biggest virtual trade show that I've ever uh, heard of. It was called Ecom Expo, and it was a virtual trade show for e-commerce vendors. It has its own Wikipedia page, so if you're interested after this webinar, you can look it up. And it was produced by a company that I eventually worked for called InExpo. That was a virtual events platform company. They still exist today. They're now uh, called Intrado. And I'm quoting from the Wikipedia page where this first event was held in February of 2005. And you'll see by the dates it was a three-day uh, virtual trade show. And look at in the middle of that virtual exhibit floor, look at some of those names, Google, Yahoo, and Microsoft. These are some of the most well-known well names in tech today, and they were exhibiting in virtual trade shows in 2005. Uh, pretty surprising. So 15 years ago, and really back then, I don't think a lot of you or a lot of people even had awareness of, of what a virtual event was. So you, you'll see some of the numbers from that are quoted in the Wikipedia page, 1,600 attendees, 92 exhibitors. That's amazing. That's like bigger than a lot of physical trade shows today, and 75 presentations. So I got my start in virtual events back in the year 2008. I was working for a technology media company, and my job was, oh, I, I manage these webinars like we're on today, a webinar. And I was with technology vendors on how they were how they could use webinars to reach uh, to generate leads, and I saw virtual events as the next evolution of multimedia lead generation. So instead of say watching a 60-minute webinar, someone like HP or Cisco could host a half-day virtual event or even a full-day virtual event, and they would learn so much more about the participant in that virtual environment because you're not just watching a webinar. You are going to different uh, virtual booths. You're interacting with sales reps or, or marketing reps in those virtual booths. You're going to chat in the networking lounge. So there was just so much more that an uh, a advertiser or an organizer of a virtual event could learn about their audience. Now, back then, so I got my start in 2008. I then went to work for the vendor in Expo in 2009. And at that time, I then started to work with their clients or our clients on virtual events. So from 2009 to about 2013. So I worked with a lot of companies that I would say were the early adopters or the pioneers of virtual events. Uh, a lot of it was in the tech technology sector. 
Center. So I worked, had the chance of working with HP, IBM, Cisco, and others. And I'll show you a couple of screenshots of some great Cisco virtual events. Um, back then, um, the challenge was just convincing others to, to come on board. So it's a completely different time now. We're in the midst of a global pandemic. Virtual events and webinars are kind of, besides online media like email and blog posts, et cetera, uh, it's, it's the only way you can reach your audience, given that for now, most of us are still sheltered at home. Let me just, I'm continuing in the past, because I think the past does provide some great clues to where we are today and where the future is going to go. I had the privilege of working with Cisco on a couple of their virtual event initiatives way back in 2009. What you see on the screen is Cisco Live Virtual. You may know that Cisco has a great uh, customer conference called Cisco Live, which continues today. Back in 2009, um, and I know Cisco Live is global, but they do have a, an event that takes place in San Francisco. I think they still use the Moscone Center in San Francisco. And in 2009, they, had, they did have the physical event at the Moscone Center in San Francisco. But if you remember 2009, we we're still in the midst of the financial crisis that hit in 2008. So a lot of attendees who usually fly and make arrangements to, to travel to San Francisco to attend this conference in person had, could, couldn't do so. So Cisco uh, rightfully decided to create what, what's called a hybrid event where they took the, this virtual component, which you see on the screen, and they allowed people who couldn't travel to San Francisco to attend online. They made a lot of their sessions available. I think they even made some of the certification that you need, like certification credits that you get for Cisco certification. They made that available online. So if you attended the online webinar, you still got credits. They even made certain Cisco executives available exclusively to the online audience. So the CPO of Cisco at the time, Padmasri Warrior, she was a speaker in person. But the virtual event, they gave the virtual attendees exclusive access to a chat with Pad Masri after her session. So it was a great way to make uh, the online very differentiated. Then I worked with another group within Cisco that does their annual global sales meeting. They used to call it GSM for global sales meeting. In 2009, Cisco, because of budget cuts, uh, they used to meet annually in Vegas, week-long meetings, and then a lot of fun, if you will, in Vegas. They cut that, the budget for that meeting, so they, they said, we're no longer going to meet in Vegas. And they moved the entire event virtual. So it was called rebranded to GSX, the Cisco Global Sales Experience. <clears throat> we, uh, as part of the implementation team, there's an agency hired to develop a lot of the creative. And you see this is the home screen. Really nice. Even 11 years ago, this is really captivating visual. So this is what a sales uh, rep at Cisco would see when they logged in. And they were required to attend this meeting, this virtual experience all week because uh, just like any other annual sales kickoff, you're, <laughs> you're required to be there. And they were in this virtual environment for the entire week. On this slide, you'll see a uh, alternate reality game, which is uh, ARG. Uh, you can look, uh, do a Google search on what that is. But it was a, a game that was designed by the agency to engage Cisco sales, uh, to the attendees. It, it unfolded in real time. There was elements of um, like the real world that you had to integrate. And then obviously Cisco used some of the technologies like WebEx to, for sales participants to use. So this really immersive experience and it really created a lot of competition and fun. And here was in the real world, this was the team. We were on site at Cisco's headquarters in San Jose. I, I'm seated all the way to the right in this, like, in this maroon shirt. This was the uh, war room where we got together throughout the event and monitored it. And you'll see there's big dashboards. Everyone's monitoring the event on their laptops. At the end of the virtual event, we had a really special visit from Cisco's then CEO, John Chambers, who popped in to thank us all. So this is, this, don't get me wrong, this is huge, a large scale virtual event. You may never work on one quite this grand, but um, the reason I show this is to show you some of the thing, innovative things that happened in the past. 
to perhaps get you to think about what we can do now and in the future with the power of digital. Okay, so that's enough about the past. Uh, I thought you might like just to see, for those of you who are not familiar with what virtual events were like, uh, what, they, what they were like way back in 2009. Uh, we're now back to 2020, so welcome back. And what do you think everyone's talking about? I, when the global pandemic first hit and the Democratic primaries were happening, uh, this was a few months ago, I visited the homepage of the New York Times and I saw the word virtual events on the homepage of the, uh, sorry, the homepage of the New York Times. And I said, for someone who had worked on these things 10 years ago and had a hard time convincing others what, even what they were, I said, wow, this is, this is different now. And of course, if you're a marketer today, as I mentioned earlier, you probably have planned one already or you're thinking about it because it is really, for now, the only way to connect with our audience as far as an event goes. All right. So before, oh, oh here we go, sorry. So this is what I think of as the continuum, continuum of experiences that you can use to connect with an audience. Um, right now, we are in the middle one, which is a webinar. Uh, let me step back even to the left. So there, there's a lot of ways you can connect online. There, there's something as simple as sending an email newsletter, which I don't cover in this continuum. But these are more of like synchronous ways to connect with your audience today. On the left, if you're familiar with Twitter chat, you can get together at a certain time. This could be Twitter chat or it could be on something like Slack or Microsoft Teams. So there's no audio or video. You're basically typing at the keyboard and interacting with other folks, but you're doing it in real time. So uh, just like this particular webinar started at a specific time and it ends at a specific time, scheduled chats occur during that, this particular window. So I participate in a few Twitter chats for marketing. Uh, this is still a good a, a way that you can assemble and connect with an audience. Now if you move further down the continuum of the webinar like we're in now, you have audio, slides, you have the ability to do Q&A, text-based chat perhaps, polls. There's some cases where I've attended Zoom meetings where you can upvote questions so you can have some audience participation and feedback on what questions they like most, and that can give good signals to the host on which questions to pose to the presenter. Next, you get to a virtual event, and there's a lot of different ways you can think about a virtual event, and I'm going to talk about some of that. I would hate for you to think of a virtual event as merely a series of webinars, because really, <laughs> if you just think of a virtual event as, let's do three webinars back-to-back, -back, or maybe a 15-minute break in between, that's really just doing webinars. A virtual event also often will be on a platform. Uh, Zoom is one platform that marketers are using for virtual events, and Zoom has different capabilities that can be used to engage with an audience. There are other vendors like the one I work for, and then there's many others that, that are available today. I'm not going to cover the vendor space in today's webinar, but just know that there are plenty of vendors out there uh, across a range of features and prices. And features they tend to have are they also have, like I showed you in some of those screenshots, uh, virtual booths for sponsors, a networking lounge where you can interact with other uh, attendees, a prize center, maybe there's prizes available in the virtual event, a leaderboard for some gamification, also linked to the prize center. Uh, and then next you have the, the, co the concept of a hybrid event, which is taking a virtual event, or maybe better yet, taking a face-to-face -face physical conference. At some point, physical conferences will return in some form and adding the virtual component. So the Cisco Live that I showed, the example from 2009, that was a hybrid event in which they took the in-person Cisco Live conference and added a virtual extension. Um, so those, this is really the continuum of what you can consider. Before I get into specific things about virtual events, I want to just give you uh, five things to think about. Some big, big picture things. I think some of these observations you can apply to your virtual event strategy. Others, I think, uh, you can just apply to your overall marketing or how you're thinking about marketing. Uh, so let's take a look at the five. So this is an obvious statement. Things have permanently changed. But I think the interesting word here is permanently. 
Uh, I believe that there's some elements of our work lives and our personal lives that we're unfortunately never going to go back to. Uh, some say that the, this global pandemic that we're in now has accelerated things that were already in play or already in motion, maybe things like remote work, where now that everyone's working from home, we, we realize what all the great benefits are. And maybe even though it's safe to return to offices at some point, they'll probably be reconfigured. Um, maybe remote work is now a thing that's just going to be the usual way we work these days. So my belief is that virtual, or more appropriate, the digital events will now be a part of everything we do. So even though we will return at some point to face-to-face -face experiences, we'll probably start with small-scale gatherings as we maybe work up at some point to the huge conferences we had in the past. I think digital is here to stay. Uh, so let me give you an example of that. So I happen to run the Bay Area Content Marketing Meetup. Uh, Arm Treasure Data has, has been a supporter of our meetup, so I thank them for that. We used to meet once a month in the Bay Area over uh, an expert presentation. We'd order pizza, have some water and soda. Um, and we did this once a month for uh, four years. Uh, when, the, when the pandemic hit, we still had some face-to-face -face events on the calendar, but we obviously were not permitted to, to, um, to get together in person. So what we did was we quickly pivoted to this. And by the way, if you want to find us, we're on meetup.com. Just search for Bay Area Content Marketing. We have moved to one or two um, online meetings per week. We shifted. We originally met at um, after hours, after work, around 6 p.m. And we now shifted to noon time, so noon Pacific. One of our members uh, called this Zooms at noon. But even though it's noon time in uh, California, we now, and this is completely open and free to anyone who wants to attend. Uh, so even though it's noon in California, anyone who is awake <laughs> and has internet access can attend our meetups. We actually have one uh, later today at 12 noon. And the amazing thing is that we still see some of our regulars, some of our Bay Area regulars in, uh, we, we use Zoom by the way, we still see them in the Zoom, but now we see so many more people from across the world. We also see some people that um, were in the Bay Area, but they could never attend. So they have kids. They had to go home to feed their kids dinner, or maybe they had a 90-minute commute just to get home to their, to their home in the Bay Area. So it was never convenient for them to make it back out to our meetup at 6 p.m. And they are now telling me, now that you're online, it's so convenient because I can now attend. And during our first online meetup, we had an attendee from Mumbai, India. Uh, we happened to, at that time, meet at, I think, 6 p.m. So for him, it was morning. And I just find it amazing and empowering that we can now connect with people halfway around the world. Um, it's, and and my, my point in sharing this is that these, these online meetups we're doing, I believe, for our meetups, are going to stay forever. We will return when it's safe to in-person meetups, but we're just going to continue doing these online version because of how um, valuable they've been to our audience. So I would start to think about ways that you've adapted your marketing during the pandemic, and uh, some of it is, might be short-term. But for other things, think about maybe it, this has uh, forced you to be more creative and find interesting ways to connect with the audience. Think about the ones that you're going to just continue doing just like with our meetups. All right, number two. Uh, I know that a lot of you in the audience are marketers, so you, some of you might be users of marketing automation systems, or maybe you're, you work with um, a customer data platform like Arm Treasure Data. Think about all the power that exists at your fingertips. You have a bird's eye view of customer or prospect data. Uh, for marketing automation, you get to see how prospects are progressing through your website and through your different content assets. You can use things like lead scoring or predictive analytics to figure out of your prospects which are the most or the best to send to sales, like those that are most likely to have a budget and have project and have an interest in your offering. Now think about face-to-face -face events. And if you're, uh, if you're an event planner, 
um, without any online component, you could get business cards at your booth. You could uh, scan a badge. Or, uh, you, could, you could have that badge scanner. You might have a sales rep that has a great conversation with a prospect at your booth. What do they do? <laughs> they usually type in the notes on their laptop or sometimes when I've been a booth, when I've done booth duty, I had to write the notes on the back of a business card to be like, this person is really interested. We need to um, follow up with this person and then hope that the business card gets into the right hands. Like it's so easy for a great conversation at your physical booth to get lost because the business card lost or you didn't get the notes from the business card to the right person. Virtual events change all that because with some of these platforms that I mentioned, and these will probably be more ones where you have to spend a little bit more budget, you can, you can basically have the same power of marketing automation or similar power to a CDP at your fingertips in that you can see all of the activities that people in the virtual environment did. You can even get transcripts of the chats they had with your uh, booth representatives. So it's very much like uh, a marketing automation platform power, uh, and that's the power of digital is that in the physical event space, you never had so much uh, the ability to do so much um, qualifying, uh, but you do now on, with the virtual event platform. All right, the third thing is your audience is now global. I say this because um, in most cases that I've seen, uh, webinars like this one or virtual events are generally open to anyone. So there's a registration page and we you generally accept anyone. There might be some cases where it's invitation only or you have, to, you have to go through a qualification step to gain access to the event. So like you register and maybe you're not in a target country and they'll, you'll get back from the organizer saying, uh, sorry, this is really reserved for North America. But I, every virtual event I've seen so far is, is, um, is open to everybody. And this is a, like an unintended but positive impact of events being digital and anyone can register. Uh, so even if you're in a far off country, I mentioned that attendee that joined us from India, as long as you're awake and you have internet access, you can, and you want to attend this uh, event, you can. So what does that mean? That means you've you're expanded your audience beyond what you might usually think of as your target demographic. So many of you might have marketing programs that are def in defined geographies, North America, EMEA, et cetera. Maybe you're mostly focused on selling to North America. So your product doesn't apply to Asia Pack right now, or at least not at the current moment. <laughs> but you are going to be attracting audience members from Asia Pack. So two things to think about. One is how do you adjust your topics, your themes, and your messaging to an audience that might, be, might not be U.S. focused and whose primary language might not be English? I'm not saying you have to all, all, uh, just run out and do translations for all of your webinars, but at least think about the fact that your audience may be folks that are beyond your current geography. Uh, also, there's, there's going to be cultural differences. So when, when folks attend your webinar and you use memes or culture, re cultural references that are very recognizable to a U.S. audience, it may not be recognizable to somebody in Asia Pac. So just something, something to think about. Secondly, um, how will you follow up with people that are not, not in your target demographic? Maybe for now you have them on a nurture list and you just engage with them over time. But let's say in three years your business is so successful that you're now, you've globally expanded and now you do sell, sell to Asia Pack. Wouldn't that list of Asia Pack virtual event attendees that you nurture come in handy at that point? So think, think ahead and uh, just because someone is attending from some country that you probably is not a focus of yours right now, uh, don't, don't disregard them. They, they could be some uh, valuable to you down the road. And also think about how you can best connect with them in a way that might not be, say, U.S. centric. Okay, let's move on. So this is one of my pet peeves with virtual events. Um, the pet peeve is one and done. So let me repeat that. One, <laughs> one of my biggest pet peeves of virtual events is the concept of one and done. Um, in a physical event world, your three-day conference at the Moscone Center 
in San Francisco is kind of over at the end of day three, you can't run that year round, right? Because even if you had the money to pay the Moscone Center, uh, they're probably going to kick you out because Dreamforce is coming up in a few weeks. <laughs> but obviously, digital is different. You can have an environment open 365 days a year. So think about it more like your website or your blog where you want people to be coming all the time, even when you're asleep. That's how I would want you to think about events. Obviously, by the nature of the word, we all think about an event as happening in a point in time and then it's over. I want you to rethink that whole approach and take, basically take a content marketing mentality to your event strategy and have, an, have a desire, just as you do with your content marketing, your website, your blog, to connect with your audience every day of the year. All right, so focus on community building. This is really ties back to my last point about um, engaging with your audience 365 days of the year. Uh, so I think this is a time where we have a global pandemic. We have a lot of social injustice happening in the world. This is a great time to just, to just give back to your community without expecting anything in return. I think it's a great time to, to foster connections with your community. I've seen some B2B brands that are hosting Zoom meetings with marketing experts. They're just looking to provide free education to marketers. They're not asking for, they're not providing a registration page. They're just like, just come on in. They don't get the experience. Um, it, it's a tremendous opportunity to connect with people and uh, focus on giving. I think if you do that, there may not be immediate short-term interest, like you're not going to close a sale necessarily next week but I think the benefits will accrue over time, and I think your brand and the appreciation of your brand will come along for the ride. Okay, so now that I've talked about some big picture things, I'll talk about some questions to answer before you start planning your virtual event. Um, it might be too late for some of you. You might, you might be already in the midst of planning your virtual event, but maybe this, you think about this for your next one. I think it's important just to do some, some um, inward thinking with your, yourself and your team and say, do we have good questions to these 10 answers before we actually go to our boss to request budget for a virtual event? So the first, oh, so I'm, I'm going to do these five at a time. So the number one is the why. And there's a famous TED Talk by Simon Sinek that's titled Start With The Why. You may have seen it. Uh, Simic asks, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. So there's a practical why to, your, to why you're having a virtual event. It could be we have business goals to hit this quarter. Uh, we were originally doing a physical event, so we have to have a, a virtual event. I get that. I'm not going to debate that why. But I would want you to think a little bit more about a deeper about the why. So maybe and why virtual, or why a virtual event versus, say, just a Twitter chat or a, a webinar. Uh, it could be that you, your why is that your, a browser-based experience can bring introverts together in a way that a physical experience does not. Maybe you, you happen to be in an organization where, um, you're, you, let's say, <laughs> you're an organization that supports introverts. And the why is that in a virtual event, introverts can be much more expressive or have much less hesitation to speak up because it is on chat, for instance. Um, I happen to notice that in our meetups, we're getting a lot more questions in the Zoom version than we did in face-to-face -face because maybe in a face-to-face, -face you were less, you were more hesitant to raise your hand and speak up because of the dynamics of being in person. So think about like really why, beyond the logistical why, like what is the conceptual why that you're even doing this? as a virtual event. Are you giving yourself enough time is number two. This one is tough because there's been a lot of cases where people had a physical event planned in Q2. The, global, the shelter at home orders went in place and you could no longer have that event, which was a month away, and you had to pivot. Um, in some cases, people just picked a date that was like one month out and they just, they just I don't want to use the word scrambled, but they just worked really hard and they met the date. I am in favor of figuring out reasonable timelines. I know you do have time-sensitive business goals, but figure out what is going to be 
reasonable enough to pull this whole thing off because you can have um, a rushed virtual event that has, issues, that has technical issues or even like you forget things uh, versus giving yourself a little bit more time and doing it better. So definitely figure out what is a good time, reasonable time frame for pulling this all off. I, I am hearing a lot of cases where everyone's just scrambling and just trying to make it happen, but like use time to your advantage if you can. Paid ticketing, this kind of goes to, well, there's two angles to this question. One is if you're m migrating a physical event to virtual, how are you handling the people that have already paid for your in-person conference? Are you just going to convert them over to a certain tier in your virtual? Or if you're doing virtual from scratch, uh, are you going to make it free or are you going to charge? So those are important questions for you and your team to address. I think if you have experience as an event planner, then you probably, this, this goes back to things you do all the time with your, your paid uh, physical events so that the question should be relatively straightforward, but you also have to work with your technology partner or partners to figure it out, for instance, how are you going to capture the paid ticket, the credit card processing, et cetera. The next one has speakers, like how are you going to handle and recruit your speakers? So again, if you had a physical event that got migrated, take a look at the speaker agreement. Are they, do you have to renegotiate or get the speakers to commit to presenting in your virtual version? If it's a virtual event from scratch, maybe you have certain celebrity keynote speakers, like figure out if they are, they're great in person, of course, figure out if they are well suited to be able to present to a virtual audience in which they might be on a webcam maybe even without a webcam like I am on now, are they going to be comfortable with that? They're not going to have a lot of people who are trained, professionally trained to speak to a physical audience are used to certain things like feedback of eye contact, body language. You don't have that in a virtual event. So uh, select your speakers accordingly. Uh, the neat thing I've seen is that a lot of physical events that have celebrity speakers, they've kept those same celebrity speakers and those celebrity speakers have learned how to work with these different platforms and do, do a great job. So uh, I've enjoyed seeing that. Uh, have you worked hey, out important? Yes. We actually have a question, if you don't mind me um, uh, squeezing this in really quick. Um, sure. One of our attendees has asked, um, how do you or how can you measure the quantitative impact on your brand with these type of community building type events? That's a good question. It, in some cases, you have to accept the scenario that it might not be directly quantitatively measured or attributable. It's more of like a going on, on, um, going on a confidence that you're doing good for the community. I think, so there's, there's not going to be a typical marketing automation campaign where you send something out and you can track the direct response. There might be more loose tracking or loose attribution. So let's say, for example, you're hosting or even in the case of my, the meetups that I host, um, that's something I don't really do any sort of quantitative tracking for. But in, one, in many cases, I have a, been doing these meetups for years, and someone will contact me with an opportunity. So I know that without having done that meetup, that person, because that person was someone I met from organizing these meetups, the, meetup, the fact that I was giving back to the community would not have presented that opportunity to me. So if you're a brand and you're doing, say, monthly Zoom meetings with the, your marketing community, um, you might have suddenly an inbound request for a, a pricing request for speaking to sales. That's difficult to track because it's hard to know precisely that that person um, came to your website after attending the Zoom. But um, there could be some great things that like that result, which maybe ends up with an opportunity or sale, uh, could have been sourced from you giving back. So it's not a great answer that I have because it's not fully quantifiable, but my belief is that you will still be the good karma you're putting into the world has returned. <laughs> great. Thank you. Sure. All right, let's hop into the next set. Of, oh, I think I – didn't finish number five, which is the registration details. This is similar to the, the note or the question about paid ticketing. 
Um, how, are you going to have the simplest structure for a virtual event is just one registration type, but the more complex conferences where there's multiple features per ticket type, or there's multiple, maybe there's certification involved for the one I met, the example I mentioned with Cisco Live, you will have to work out different tiers and what different tiers get. This will be a little bit more of a technology involved to work with your vendor to map out the tiers so that you collect the right uh, ticket type when the, the attendee uh, requests the ticket. And then the vendor then has to enforce that the, just like in a physical event, you have a certain ticket that gives you access to say a, um, a training and someone at the door is scanning your ticket to make sure you have access to that pay training, the technology platform will also need to support you on your ability to have a similar arrangement. All right, so next five. Um, this number six is similar to my first point on what's your why. Um, the vision of your virtual event is like, what is the experience going to be really about? A, an easy thing to do for those of you who are used to physical conferences is reproduce some of the elements of a physical event in virtual. What I hear from a lot of experts these days who are working with clients is, let's not do that. Let's not simply recreate the networking lounge and make the booths look like physical booths and things of that nature. Let's dream up what an experience digitally can be it doesn't have to make people feel comfortable that it's like a conference. Let's just use the full potential of the online experience. And I think over time there's going to be more interesting technologies integrated. I believe virtual reality, like wearing goggles to a virtual event, is going to be something that's coming soon. Uh, so the vision is really about what is a, the most awesome experience you can create for your attendees uh, who will then, if the virtual event experience is amazing for an attendee, and you have sponsors involved, that should that benefit should accrue to sponsors as well because the attendees will be that much more active and more inclined to engage with sponsors. So if you saw the at the beginning, I showed you the Cisco Global Sales Experience. That was a really grand vision that I thought the team pulled off phenomenally. Uh, it was probably the most rewarding project I've ever worked on. Okay, number seven, can your existing team pull this off? You might have event marketers on your team. They're great at, at working physical events. Maybe they've never worked with a virtual event technology platform before. So do you have some people that maybe some contractors you can use that can help? There is an industry certification from an event management organization called PCMA, uh, called Digital Event Strategist, or DES. You can go, I think it's pcma.org. You can go to the website. You should be able to find information on this certification. And it's all about digital events. And so you can complete this program. I believe it's all online and get a DES certification. And it's, a lot of my peers that I worked with back in 2009 subsequently uh, went and got this certification. And so if you're, a, if you're working on your own virtual event, that's something you might want to think about is, find out does someone I'm hiring to bring onto my team have a certification like this? Or at minimum, tell me about the virtual events you as the contractor or a new team member have worked on in the past. Number eight is delivering leads to sponsors. This is something in a physical trade show that you do all the time. In a virtual event, you just have to, to confirm with your team how, how is it going to be done. Uh, and like that's the logistics. On the business side, you have to figure out as you sell different sponsor levels to your sponsors, what do they get and what qualifies as a lead? Are you just going to give them the list of everyone that registered? It's probably not that valuable to a sponsor because a lot of those people aren't qualified and may, may not have heard of the sponsor. Are you going to allow sponsors to sponsor the keynote or a particular webinar and they get the list of people that attended that? And that's something that's done quite often at physical conferences. Or do you just give them leads for people that entered their virtual booth? So you have to figure out how are sponsors going to be, how is the, what is the definition of a lead, and how are you going to deliver them to sponsors? And will your target audience attend a virtual event? So we have 
a lot of different generations in the workplace. I have a daughter who's Gen Z who grew up with a smartphone. <laughs> we have millennials, we have uh, Gen X, baby boomer. Maybe there are different generational views on technology. So maybe baby boomers or the great generation, or if that's your target audience, maybe they are not comfortable with going to their browser or tablet to attend a virtual event. Whereas Gen Z probably will just jump right in. Just think about your target audience and their appetite like for a virtual event. Obviously, you, you probably know wh whether they were inclined to attend your physical event, but you have to think about whether they will come to experience it virtually. Last one, this could be the topic of an entire webinar, how to keep your audience engaged. It's no longer just about a great keynote speaker and the ability to network because the dynamics online are a little bit different than meeting people in a large room face-to-face. -face. So think about ways you can keep that audience engaged. And as I mentioned earlier, there's just so much available with an online platform, with online tools, that you can really dream up things that no one's experienced before. So that concludes the presentation portion today. I'll hand it back to you. All right. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, that was a great presentation. Really appreciate that, Dennis. So um, before we move on to the questions, I actually wanted to briefly introduce Arm Treasure Data. For over eight years, we've actually been helping companies solve, solve, solve complex data problems across enterprise. Our parent company, Arm, has 95% coverage across smartphones globally, and we're fully backed by SoftBank. With over 400 customers and having the biggest presence in the Forbes Global 2000 market, we are honored to have received several awards, and our strengths rely in security, scalability, architecture, and privacy compliance. We're really happy to have all of you here, and uh, I'm going to move on into the question. So, from all of you who are viewing, um, please start submitting your questions. Um, actually, it looks like we have one. Dennis, this is for you. Uh, what will the virtual event of the future look like? I'm going to I'm going to give um, we give a cop out answer, and then I'll give my attempt at a real answer. <laughs> the cop out is. I really want to see what the future looks like. I, I no longer work directly in virtual events, but I'm excited at what the future holds. There's been some really creative things that I've seen. I participated in one in April where the organizer used Zoom and a, the, there was a panel discussion. I think the topic was how to engage with your work from home employees. So I decided to attend that because I was curious on the topic. And the moderator turned out to do something super creative which is they used uh, the theme of Chopped, which I think is a food TV show in which you have contestants who get a fixed set of ingredients and they have to cook a dish based on those ingredients and then they present it to judges. So the panel discussion was with a Chopped theme. They even had um, I think the Chopped, uh, like the chopped uh, logo. And there was three, it was either three or four panelists that were in their kitchen literally in their kitchen, and they um, had the audience in Zoom, or actually they used Zoom plus Slack. So in Slack, they asked the audience to propose the ingredients. Then the panelists uh, at, literally cooked in their kitchens while answering questions related to the panel. And then at the end, they presented their creation to the audience on, this is of course using webcams, and the audience voted, voted on a winner. So. That's like creativity without technology. That's just really a fun virtual event. That was probably the most fun virtual session I've ever attended. Then there's the technology aspect and how you stitch experiences together. And I'm just so excited to see about, like that's just one example I saw recently. There's, just, there's gonna be so many more creative things happening and I'm excited to see that. But as I mentioned earlier, I think um, virtual, so the virtual event of now is tied to a computing device like your laptop, tablet, in some cases a phone. I think we're going to start to be unleashed soon and 
if you think of the concept of virtual reality goggles and virtual reality experiences, there I saw on VentureBeat one article about a company that's using virtual reality for business meetings, in which case you're like in interacting with others within the virtual reality experience, and just crazy, like crazy good things can happen when you're in the, this virtual world. Um, and I saw a recent example where you, one vendor uh, hosted a concert where you put on your virtual reality goggles at home and you actually go into some concert venue where a DJ spins up songs. So I could see a future where we could be attending conferences from our home or from wherever we are with virtual reality goggles and walking around and interacting with people just like we would in a physical conference. That's pretty cool. I don't know how I would, uh, you know, walk around the whole conference in my house, but I hope I could uh, <laughs> at least find space in my yeah. garage. <laughs> yeah, we could still get, we'll still get some good exercise <laughs> attending a virtual event from home. That's awesome. Um, all right, we have another question. Um, one of our viewers says, how do I go about selecting a virtual event platform? Ah, so I mentioned earlier, I'm not going to go into specific platforms. I think there are resources out there that provide a comparative look at some of the platforms. I think one thing I would map out is I presented those 10 questions you should answer. So some of the output of that is going to help you determine a requirements list for a, a vendor platform. I also showed earlier in the webinar this continuum where you can get really simple like a webinar all the way up to these super elaborate conferences like the one I showed at the very beginning with the e-commerce virtual trade show of I think 90, 92 exhibitors. So use some of the output of your 10 questions and like you, d you do want to map out your like I said the vision of your virtual event and that should then translate in some form to here are the features we need the platform to support. I also mentioned the things like ticket tiering and uh, things of that nature. So if you definitely want to have different ticket types which have different features, that's a requirement for sure. So then take that requirement list. Just maybe look, find others who have done virtual events recently, others in your industry or some of your LinkedIn connections and ask them who they use and if they have recommendations on the vendors. But definitely get that vision document or almost like a requirement, the, the planning document for what your virtual event's gonna look like first, because that will then determine which vendors are best suited. Great. Uh, we have another question. Um, it says, uh, would you give an example of performance indicators you you use to determine the event's relevance, its ability to engage the audience to provide clients or management teams with an indication of success? Ooh, let me uh, re-parse this question. Performance indicators determine the relevance. Gauge the, yeah, I think some simple metrics are average um, session time, so similar to like web marketers when you look at time on site, time on page. Um, obviously, it doesn't capture everything because you could have just logged in and walked away for the day. <laughs> so you want to combine like your average duration with the number of sessions they attended, average session, the, the time they spent in each session. Uh, some platforms do track uh, the different areas of the event they visited, whether they um, you can get some success measures for your sponsors to see how active were attendees in different sponsors.